So what we are going to see now is a very, very powerful ensembling technique called the method of boosting. Um, and it is a very general technique, uh, but we look at a very specific algorithm uh, which is called as the add a boost algorithm. So, this uh, algorithm is due to uh, Frond and Shafire. Um, I think uh, back in the uh, 90s. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Frond and Shafire won the Godel Prize uh, for coming up with this algorithm uh, for their contributions to theoretical machine learning, um, especially coming up with this uh, technique of boosting. So, what is the idea of boosting? Uh, boosting also tries to, you know, um, start with a weak learner and then convert it into a strong learner in a very, very theoretically sound principle fashion. Um, now, these weak learners need not necessarily be overfit classifiers. These weak learners could be underfit classifiers also and that is one of the reasons why boosting is a very powerful technique because it is very easy to get quick underfit classifiers. For example, if you are running a decision tree algorithm and then you cut your uh, stop your algorithm after you just run you know figure out one single uh, question some feature less than threshold value. Uh, now, that is a weak learner right. So, because uh, you are that is I mean basically that is going to have a high bias. Uh, with respect to the bias that we discussed earlier because it is it's going to be a very, very simple classifier. It is going to, for instance, if you are in a two-dimensional plane, it is just going to cut your uh, feature space into two parts and say that one side is positive, the other side is negative, right. So, it could be a vertical cut or a horizontal cut depends on which feature you are choosing, but then it is a very simpli simplistic classifier. Um, in higher dimension, it is even more simple, right. So, but then it is easy to obtain because you do not have to spend too much computational effort to obtain this such a classifier, right. So, a decision stump in this case, uh, typically when we talk about uh, boosting, uh, we are talking about uh, decision stumps as our uh, weak learners. What are decision stumps? Decision stumps are just, you know, classifiers like this, right. So, uh, one level or two level classifiers. Sometimes you can even use two levels, which means that you are asking two different questions to decide plus, min plus one or minus one. The typical number of uh, height of a decision tree in practice would be something like 10 to 15. Uh, but then if you are cutting it out at one or two, then it is typically going to, that is going to be a significant drop in accuracy uh, because you have not trained it enough, uh, which means that you are looking at a very simple weak learner, the very high bias, low variance, but a high bias weak learner. Um, now, the question is, um, can we somehow combine right let us say I have an access to a access to a algorithm which when given a data set is going to output a weak learner um, which could be a decision stump for example. Can I use this black box in, a, in an intelligent way such that I can convert this weak learner into a strong learner which will give me let us say 0 training error right. So, if I start with a, a data set where I use a weak learner which just asks one question to decide my classification. Um, that is not going to get me 100 percent training uh, accuracy, right. So, whereas um, can we somehow use this weak learner as a black box to kind of massage what is being fed into the weak learner uh, so that we kind of get a different classifier, um, we will see how, uh, which, which kind of gives you zero training error. If, if you get something like that, then that is what we are going to call as a strong learner in this case. The question is, can we go from a weak learner to a strong learner? Boosting says, yes, this is possible uh, and it gives you an algorithmic way to achieve this. And we will, let me put down the algorithm and then we will start discussing what this algorithm is. Um, okay. So, here is the algorithm, right. So, this is the add a boost algorithm, which uh, stands for adaptive boosting, the ADA stands for adaptive and uh, as usual the input to the algorithm is just a data set. Let us call this data set S yes, uh, which is x1, y1 dot 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 x and y n where our x i is in R d and y i is plus or minus 1. Now, the main idea is we are going to replace our two steps of bagging with more principal steps. If you remember from bagging, the first step was uh, 
create these bags <coughs> right so on each of the bag is created by uniformly sampling with replacement from the uh, initial data set that you had here we are going to create bags in a slightly different way uh, we are not going to think of them as bags but then let's say we are going to think of them as weights associated with each data point and we'll see what's the connection with the bags in a minute so what we are going to do is we are going to initialize um, some weights or a distribution over these data points uh, which let me call them as d naught of i is 1 over n uh, what is d naught of i this not separate uh, i mean indicates the iteration number so at initialization every data point i gets an uniform weight right so which means that um, what i'm going to do now is create a bag from the original data set based on these weights you can imagine it that way which means that if the weights are all the same then the way i am going to create the bag data points in the bag is to sample from the original data set yes according to this probabilities which means every point gets a chance of 1 over n to be in the bag <coughs> to the for the next point i am again going to use the same distribution to sample a point which means that essentially we are sampling uniformly sampling um, with replacement now this is only for the initialization the idea now in boosting is we are going to change this distribution at every round right so this is an iterative algorithm where at every round this distribution is not no longer going to be uniform it's going to change and let's see how it changes uh, <clears throat> let me put down the algorithm and then we'll it will be clear how it changes right so now what happens is for t equals 1 to capital t right so you have t different rounds and we'll decide what t is in a bit um, what you are going to do is we are going to input the current distribution dt and the data set st uh, to a weak learner to get uh, ht right so let's say ht is this uh, what do i mean by this well you have a weak learner when I say you are inputting s comma dt to this weak learner, basically you can either think of the weak learner getting as input the data points and some weights associated with this data points. If the weak learner can handle data points along with weights, if we have an algorithm which can handle not just data points, but we are also saying some weights associated with this data points, then fine, we can input both the data set and the weights associated with it to the learner. If the, if the algorithms that we have seen so far, right, so it's typical algorithms like decision trees and so on, uh, in the, the vanilla version flavor of the algorithm, uh, they do not handle specifically the weights associated with data points. In which case, what you can do is you can create a bag based on dt from yes, by which I mean that dt is telling me how important is each data point for this bag. Right, so it's giving me some probability. If a, if a, if the weight dt of i is 0.7, it means that if I sample from this distribution a data point, 70% chance that this data point shows up. Right, so that's what 0.7 means. And then I kind of do this n different times, and then I create a bag, which I have created according to dt from yes. Right, so I hope that is clear. Uh, and now if I pass it on to a weak learner, I now run a decision tree on top of this and then I get out a classifier which I am going to call as HT. So that is the tth classifier that I am getting in round 1. So which means that basically we are training a weak learner on a bag uh, which is generated according to some distribution DT and then we are calling the resulting classifier as HT. Remember HT is uh, RD2 plus or minus 1, right. So it's a it's, it's a lean it's a binary classification problem so it's a binary classification so now what we are going to do is this is the interesting part in boosting now we are going to change the distribution which which we are going to use for the next round so we had some weights for each of these data points now what we are going to do is we are going to update these weights and the way we are going to update these weights is in an intuitive fashion right so now what what are we trying to do is let us say initially we created a sample, uh, we, we, we created a bag by uniformly sampling from your original data set and then we ran a decision tree and then we got a decision tree out of it, a decision stump let us say. Now you had 1000 data points at the beginning let us say and now this decision stump is classifying 600 of these points correctly and 400 of these points incorrectly let us say 
right. So now in the next round, you want a different decision tree to be learnt. Now the question is, I have the luxury now to change the weights of these data points. Now, what should I do? How The question is, how should I update these weights? Now, there are 600 points which this the first round decision tree has got correct and 400 points which the first round decision tree has incorrectly classified. Now, in the second round, should the weights of the 600 points go up or go down? That is the question that we are asking. Now, what do we intuitively want? Now, the first decision tree has done well on 600 points. Now, the second decision tree is also going to do better than random, which means that if I increase the weight of the points where the previous decision tree has not done well, has incorrectly classified, now those points will become important for the next decision tree, right. So, because they have higher weights, now if it is a weak learner, then you can argue a weak learner, basically if you are trying to sample according to, you know, weights where, uh, where some points get higher weights, now those points are going to get repeated more in your data set because they have high probability of getting chosen. So, your decision tree will try to you know do well on those data points. It will try to find features which will do well for those data points, right. Um, now, the way we are going to enforce that where we are going to enforce the next decision tree to do well on points where the previous decision tree failed to do is by updating the weights associated to the points in a specific fashion. And what is the specific fashion? Well, we are going to say the following we are going to update the weight of the ith data point in the next round as follows. We are going to update it in a multiplicative fashion. We are going to say the weight, let me first put it this way. We are going to say the weight multiplicatively increases by e power some alpha t and we will talk about alpha t in a minute, which means we are increasing the weight if h t of x i equals y i right. So, uh, which means that if the t th classifier um, well it is not equal to y which means that the if the t th classifier did not get the point x i correctly classified then what we are going to do is we are going to bump up the weight of the i th data point by e power alpha t. On the other hand we are going to say d t we are going to reduce the weight by the same alpha t, but then e power minus alpha t if h t of x i equals y i, right. So, if it is correctly classified, then I reduce the weight by a multiplicative factor. If it is incorrectly classified, then I increase it by a multiplicative factor. What this factor is, we will talk about in a bit, but this is the fact, this is how you increase the weight. But now, what happens is there is a problem here, right. So, the moment I increase by some factor and decrease by some factor, now these weights are no longer going to sum up to 1. But then I want it to be a distribution because I am going to sample from this. So, what I would do is typically I am going to you know think of this as d hat t which is like a middle in between term and then the actual updated weight is going to be you know d hat t plus 1 i divided by you know sum over j d hat t plus 1 of j. Basically, I am normalizing my weights so that they sum to 1, right. So, you can think of this as maybe initially weight was 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.2 for 3 different data points, right. So, this was the, this was um, d1 of 1, 2, uh, 3, right. So, d, of course, d0 uh, is going to be uh, 0 0.33, 0 0.33, 0 0.33 and now d1 was like this, let us say. And now the H1 classifier uh, got these two points correctly. This is X2, this is X3, this is for X1. Let us say the classifier that uh, came out of this D1 was H1, uh, which correctly classified these two points and incorrectly classified this point. So now what would D2 be? Well, D2 be will be 0 0.3 times e power alpha alpha 1 because H1 classified it incorrectly. This would be 0 0.5 into e power minus alpha 1, 0 0.2 into e power minus alpha 1. But then now these two guys, these three guys do not sum to 1. Here they sum to 1, here they sum to 1, but here they do not sum to 1. So, what we do is we divide it by 
some z so that they sum to 1 where z in this case would be 0 0.3 power alpha 1 plus 0.5 e power minus alpha 1 plus 0.2 e power minus alpha 1. Basically, you are normalizing it to sum to 1. So, now this becomes a distribution, right. So, now you can keep continuing this, right. So, uh, and you do this for t different rounds, right. So, you do this for t different rounds and, and that is it, right. So, now what you have done is you have kind of updated the weights uh, so that you are correcting the mistakes of the previous classifiers um, and you are doing this for t different rounds. And now, uh, finally, I need to tell you, well, at the end, uh, end of this procedure, you have h1 to ht, right. So, you have h1, h2 dot 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 ht, uh, t different classifiers, weak learners, which have been trained on different distributions with respect to the data. Now, the question is, how can I combine these t different learners uh, to do something, to come up with an aggregate classifier? Now, boosting says that the way to combine this is, would be to do the following. Right, so, your final classifier which we are going to call as let us say h star of x is going to be very similar to bagging, but then slightly different sum over t equals 1 to t uh, h t of x so far same, but then you are not going to average these things, but then you are going to do a weighted average of these things. Right, so, the weighted average is going to the weights are going to be given by um, the alpha t's. The alpha t's are exactly the bumping up factors for these weights, right. So, one can argue that the right weights that you need to use here are in fact alpha t's uh, and of course, you look at the sign of this classifier as usual, right. So, so basically what we have done is in boosting is we have changed both the assumptions that bagging does into something more principled. The first thing is that we have changed bootstrapping where all the bags were sampled uniformly at random. Now, we are changing it to you know ba creating bags with respect to different distributions over the data points uh, where the distributions are carefully chosen such that they kind of push the weights up for data points which had more errors with respect to the previous rounds classifier. So, th that is the bootstrapping part becomes slightly different, right, so in a more principled way in boosting and the aggregation part also becomes slightly different in the sense that we are going to use a weighted average as opposed to just doing an average. Uh, so, now what are these weights going to be? Well, again, um, if I had to uh, derive uh, goodness of the boosting algorithm, one can argue that the right way to set these weights uh, would be to do the following, your alpha t um, has to be ln of square root of you know 1 minus error of h t divided by error of h t. Well, this is this is this just comes from the analysis of the boosting algorithm. Um, basically, what you are saying is that I I gave a data set and a distribution d t to a weak learner and I got an output h t which is a weak learner a decision tree. Now, that h t makes a certain error with respect to d t, right. So, it makes a some, so some points are have high weight, some points have low weight. So, now I look at the set of points where it makes mistakes and then just add up the weights of those points with respect to d t and that is the error h t. Now, you set your alpha t based on this error h t is what boosting says. Right. So, now the way you set it is you know there is a lawn uh, and uh, you can see why the lawn has to appear here is because this is an e power something. It is somehow saying that basically you are increasing the weight by the square root of 1 minus error of h t by error of h t. Right. So, if the um, if the weighted error right. So, is low uh, then that means that you are kind of increasing it by lot or if the weighted error is high then you are increasing it by low. Right. So, that is the that, that I mean that is the that is what comes out when if you set alpha t in a very principled fashion. Um, it, it will be beyond the scope to discuss why we are setting alpha t like this, but then interested uh, audience can look at a simple proof for uh, you know uh, the boosting algorithm where you can argue that as your number of round increases, uh, you can argue if you set alpha t in this particular fashion, then the training error 
with of the final classifier right so this is the final classifier this is ht right so after t rounds you get a classifier like this and then you can ask how much training error does this classifier make on the original data set yes because it's kind of aggregating a lot of weak learners uh, weak learners are all going to make a lot of errors on my training data but then how does the training error of this aggregated classifier look like on the original data set well, one can argue that if we set alpha t in this particular way, then the training error decreases in some sense in a greedily fast rate, right. So, we can in fact uh, exactly argue that uh, I will kind of make that statement um, if t is greater than um, <coughs> a quantity which, which is as follows and we will talk about this in a bit. Then training error equals zero. One can prove, right? So one this is this is why you boosting is such a beautiful algorithm. One can prove, one can give a guarantee that if the number of rounds that you run this algorithm for is greater than a particular quantity, then your training error goes to zero. Now, what is this particular quantity? Uh, well, one the quantity involves two things. One is, you know, the number of data points. The more the da data points that you have, you know, the more rounds that you would need to get to zero training error, which is a natural thing that you would expect. But then here it is saying that, well, the number of rounds uh, is only going to depend logarithmically on the number of data points that you have, which is a good thing to have. Uh, but more importantly, what it has is, um, is a parameter gamma, um, which determines how good our weak learners are. I did not define this formally again in this uh, in this course, but this parameter says uh, how good is my weak learner, right. So, um, uh, slightly more precisely uh, what it means is that uh, <coughs> your weak learner is better than random, that is the assumption. Right. So, now how much more is it better than random is the question. Right. So, if it is accurate <coughs> 60 percent, then it is 10 percent better than 50 percent accuracy, which means that gamma is going to be 0.1. Right. So, because 60 percent is 0.6, it is 0.1 more than 0.5. If it is 70 percent accurate, then gamma is going to be 0.2. If it is 90 percent accurate, gamma is going to be 0 0.4 and so on. Right. So, basically what, what this is saying is that <coughs> if you are weak learner, so the number of rounds that your algorithm is going to take to combine the weak learners to get a strong learner which makes zero error on my training data depends on how weak the weak learner is. If the weak learner is too weak, it is just let us say 0 0.51 percent, uh, 51 percent accuracy is what it can guarantee, then this gamma is going to be 0 0.01 which means that it is a small value. So, the t is going to go up, whereas your weak learner is 0 0.75 percent, 75 percent accurate, the gamma is going to be 0 0.25 in which case the number of rounds that you need to bring the training error down to 0 is going to be lower. The stronger the weak learner is, the lesser the number of rounds. Right. So, but then how we do not know a priori that is the beautiful part of boosting. We do not know a priori how strong or weak the weak learner is, but then the guarantee is that the algorithm does not need to know how strong or weak the weak learner is. Right. So, you can keep adding more and more weak learners to your classifier and eventually the training error has to go to 0. That is what this theory would say. The, the main reason why this is such a beautiful algorithm and such a principled algorithm is that you know the previous versions of boosting that came before this needed to know this gamma, needed to know how weak the weak learner is as part of the algorithm itself. But here we do not use that at all and still we are able to you know get an algorithm which will drive the train error to 0. So, that is the power of boosting. Uh, again, we will not do the uh, you know full fledged um, derivation of why this is true um, and, and I mean one can refer to standard textbooks on boosting for this. Uh, but I would want to make uh, one uh, comment about boosting itself uh, is that, so what we are saying is if you run this algorithm for large in, large enough number of iterations, you have a lot of weak learners which you can combine such that the learner that results makes zero training error. But what we really care about is doing well on the test data. So how does boosting perform on the test data is, is a question that one needs to think about. Um, one way to think about that is to you know plot this and see what happens as a function of t as I increase the number of 
weak learners that I add to my boosted classifier, I, I can ask how does the error behave. Now, the theory says, of course, that we can prove that the error, the training error will go down to 0 and then will continue to stay at 0, right. So, there will be some t, 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 t star after which the train error will go to 0, right. So, this is train error. Now, we can imagine a situation where at after each round, right, let us say 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 after each round, I stop my boosting algorithm and I ask how much is the test error, right. So, let us say there is a test set which I have not touched for my training. I can ask how much error does my boosting algorithm make on the test set. Now, if you measure that, well, the test error will kind of also decrease. Now, one might think that the moment training error becomes 0, you have a classifier which, which gets all the data points correctly. So, now one can hope that or one can believe that after this, if I still keep adding more classifiers, well, the training error is going to remain 0, but perhaps I am starting to fit the noise a little bit more and so I will start overfitting. So, one way to check if you are really overfitting is by looking at the test error. If the test error starts, let us say, increases like this, the moment train error becomes 0, then this part is actually overfitting because you are adding more and more weak learners into your aggregate classifier that it is starting to fit the noise. But surprisingly, what happens in practice for a lot of data sets is that even after your training error goes to 0, even if you keep adding more you know, weak learners, the train error, the test error still goes down. It would not go to 0, of course, right. So, you cannot, um, because the training only provides so much information about the underlying distribution, it will not go to 0, but it will, it will, it typically still goes down, right. So, this is a very, very non-intuitive thing that typically happens because um, you would imagine that you are trying to overfit after training error 0, but then in practice that does not typically happen. I keep saying typically because you can always create data sets where you know this phenomenon is not observed that you it will start to the test error will start to increase that your, your algorithm will start to overset or overfit. Um, but in practice what people observe is that typically overfitting does not happen even after training error is 0. So, if you are running a boosting algorithm uh, it might make sense not to stop your you know number of rounds the moment your training error becomes 0, but then still continue a little bit more. So, that to see uh, if you are for instance you can look at your validation error and see if the validation error kind of goes down or it kind of starts a reversing trend and, and you can take a call on the number of you know uh, rounds that you need to run this algorithm based on your validation error. So, that is one point that I wanted to mention. Um, and, and, and of course, people have given some kind of reasoning um, in under certain conditions you can actually argue um, and again this is beyond the scope of this discussion that uh, after your training error becomes 0, the new classifier that kind of gets created, right. So, with new weak learners that get added um, ends up increasing the margin of the resulting classifier and more the margin we know better is our ability to do well on the test data. And so, boosting kind of you know does better and better even after training error becomes 0. Uh, but to formally show this is beyond the scope of this discussion. So, uh, but it is good to know that such a property exists for boosting typically in practice and it is good to look out for this when you if, if and when you are really implementing this in practice. That is one point. Um, so, in, in so to summarize you know we have a wonderful off the shelf classifier which works extremely well. And even if you have a poor classifier, it kind of boosts its accuracy really well. Um, the downside though is you cannot run it in parallel like how we did it in bagging, right. So, this, this is cannot run in parallel. And um, if you think about it, you should know why this is true because, because of the nature of the algorithm itself, right. So, you are running it in iterations and to create a weak learner, you need to know where are the mistakes done by the previous weak learner. So, which means that to create this weak learner, you have to wait for the previous weak learner. So, it has to run in a serial fashion. Whereas, bagging creates bags 
uniform sampling with replacement uh, uniformly and each bag is independent of other and I can kind of keep doing this in parallel. So, with respect to amount of time it takes to train the algorithm, it is slightly more than what bagging would do. Um, but then uh, typically um, boosting performs better in practice than bagging, again typical statements. Um, so, uh, you can also compare it, I mean some uh, people have also done a comparative study of boosting versus support vector machines and so on. Um, and usually if you start with a very good learner, right. So, very not a weak learner, but a good learner, then the improvement that you get, you typically do not get any improvement in accuracy by just boosting it, right. So, the improvement is felt more only when you have a weak learner, a poor learner, right. So, so typically you do not use, you though theory would say that you can use uh, an SPM as a weak learner potentially, but in practice you would not do that. You would use a quick and dirty algorithm like a decision stump and then you will try to boost that right. Um, so, that is so, but then if you compare boosting decision stumps versus SVM uh, in practice they typically perform comparably right. So, you cannot really say that one is always better than the other. There are some data sets where one could be better than the other and the other way around as well. So, this is the general uh, discussion that I wanted to do about <coughs> you know um, ensemble classification which is a very powerful technique. Um, I mean you do not really need to tune so many things here, right. So, because both in bagging and boosting there is no tuning involved. Um, so, we can quickly run these algorithms typically in practice. Um, of course, boosting is going to take more time because of the serial nature of it, but then typically uh, you do not need to tune any parameters per se uh, and, and that is the power of this, right. So, that is why these are called off the shelf classifiers and they work extremely well in practice. And these are the these are what we'll discuss in this course about uh, meta classifiers or ensemble classifiers. Uh, next time we'll look at um, you know we'll try to unify all these algorithms that we have seen so far under a you know common theme um, called loss plus regularization, and that will give us some perspective as to why there are so many algorithms for you know the problem of binary classification, whereas we just had one single algorithm for you know uh, linear regression or regression problems whereas we have a host of algorithm for uh, classification. Uh, so, so that we will see next time. Until then uh, take care. Thanks.